uh, even his neighborhood, and he had there were guys out on the corner with boxes of uh, Krispy Kremes. I said, man, they knew I was coming. <laughs> like, That's what I need in Savannah. Guys sitting on my street corner, so, ready for a box of donuts as I come by. That's, that's just what I need. Um, so I hope this has been fairly informative for you today. Um, we, I normally get a lot of questions about them. pretty much the high points. So when you, when you talk about what the problem is and you get to the root of the problem and you, you're like, uh, all right, now what do we do about it? I mean, we're, we're 10 years into the smartphone business. So what do we do? I mean, how do we combat all this stuff with, um, uh, with all, all these apps that are coming out? How do, we, how do we monitor this as parents? How do we as kids like, make, make sure we're not overstepping our boundaries and you know, hurting our influence and stuff? And I'll, I'll start off by telling you a story about what happened to me when I was uh, working patrol one summer, we had, uh, I was coming down our road, it was like, it was a Thursday night, about two in the morning, complete ghost town, and we have, even though they call it Richmond Hill, there is no hill in Richmond Hill, it's all completely flat. The only thing that remotely resembles a hill, we have a viaduct that a train <coughs> goes underneath, that's about the only hill we have. So I'm, I'm working one night and I'm coming down the viaduct and I just happen to glance over and I see, two guys pushing a shopping cart that they just stolen from Food Lion at full sprint with a th third one in the shopping cart. And they're going, they're, they're, they're getting it. They're full sprint. And I said, this is, okay. So I turn, I turn around to go stop them and tell them to go put the shopping cart back. And right as I turn around, they all kind of look up, give me the deer in the headlights, and they go, we're in trouble. So they go in, they run off into the ditch, dump the shopping cart, and all three of them take off into the bushes. I said, all right. <laughs> We go, we go chasing them. Uh, we, find, we find them as they get to the house that they're staying at, but they left their keys at the bar, so they didn't have keys to get in the house. They're trying to get in, but they can't. Uh, so we end up arresting all three of them. Uh, we, two of them are, they're, they're drunk, but they're not like belligerent drunk. They're just kind of that, we're drunk, we know we're in trouble, so we're just gonna cooperate and you know, just make everything smooth. So they, they went fine, but then there was the ringleader. So the ringleader just happened to be live right down the road from where I live at. Uh, and so um, we're, we're booking him in, getting everything squared away. And you know, he, he hadn't been a real big problem, but he was starting to get a little mouthy, which we expect out of drunk people. Drunk people say stuff they probably shouldn't say. Uh, water off the duck's back, as we say. I know, I know he's probably not serious. Or he doesn't really mean anything that he's saying. It's just the alcohol talking. But So I, I'm booking him in, and he starts... He starts telling me what he would do to me, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. Um, then he says, you know, I know something about you. I said, what's that? He said, I know where you live at. I said, Let's see where this is going. He said, um, I said, well, coincidentally, I know where you live at. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he says, he says, no, no, no. I know, I, I know some, some, something more. I said, I know when you're not home and your wife is. I said, oh, no, you didn't. Uh -huh. Let me stop you right there, big guy. I said, clearly you have not watched the Discovery Channel. Ever. I said, it's not an issue when you go into the bear cave and Papa Bear is not there. It's not Papa Bear. You've got to worry about <laughs> I said, you go, you go into Mama Bear's nest and, and start messing with them cubs. So I, I, I promise you, um, I will make, she will make you pay for every inch uh, of real estate you thought you were coming to. Um, so uh, to tell you he didn't get to me on that one would be a lie. Um, that, that one kind of shook me a bit. I, I've had people threaten me all the time. It's comes with a job. But I never really had somebody say, I will come to your house when you are not there. And I, I don't doubt my wife's ability to like, rip someone to pieces if, if <laughs> they were threatened. You, you understand something about my wife. My, if you ever saw my wife, um, she can look as sweet and as innocent as she can be. That, well, she is 100% hillbilly. Uh, 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 she, she knows it too, so if she's watching this, you know, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, she, she, um, she knows. Um, that's, that's not me bad talking about it. That's part of the reason why I married her. Uh, so well, I, I got home and I started talking to her. And I said, listen, you know, the guy was probably just trying to get under my skin, but I said, I, I want to make sure that our home is secure. So... We, we did a few things to make sure our, our home was secure. We, we bought an alarm system, 
Uh, so we had some cameras installed, make sure everything was kosher. Every time a door would open, I could have the uh, alarm company send me a notification. So if I was working one night and the front door opens at 3 o'clock in the morning, I know it's not my wife. Uh, so I could be, I'd be able to go straight home, see what the problem is. Or I could, I could view the cameras live off of my phone. Uh, you know, if I wanted to see, make sure everything was going good at, at, at home, you know, I could, I could look in there and I have a live stream of my living room and all my doors right, right there on my phone. So I was like, yeah, that's a good start. Um, I was like, yeah, it just, it's just not enough. So we, we, we ended up uh, getting, uh, getting a dog. I said, uh, I was like, we're not just getting like a little foo-foo dog. Like, <laughs> it's not, not like a little chihuahua. <laughs> like, that's not gonna scare anybody. So we, we bought uh, a boxer. And you know, boxer about, boxer's a very intimidating dog. And, and they're, they love families. When, if you, you get them as a puppy, they're, they're a very family-oriented dog. They, they love their family and they hate anybody who's not a part of the family. I'm like, perfect. So we'll get this dog, he's very intimidating, he's got that broad chest, he's a mean looking dog. Um, of course, nobody knew at the time, you know, he probably wouldn't like, he barely bit food. You know, he probably wouldn't bite anybody, but nobody else knew that. You know, when they came by our house and they see this really huge ferocious dog sitting there on the porch. Um, and so we had him, and he, a great dog, you know, very big deterrent for some people. You know, but I, I still felt, you know, that's just not enough. You know, I still feel we're, we're pretty secure, but you know, I'm just thinking, you know, we're, that's just not enough for, for me, because I'm a paranoid cop. So um, I told my wife, I said, you know what we really need? We need some guns. You know what my hillbilly wife said? Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, yes, perfect. So we, we have a small arsenal of guns at our house, ranging from you know, a 22 that you know, will just annoy a mouse. Um, I have, a, I have uh, some higher caliber pistols. I have a, I have a rifle that I just, bought from my, or I just got from my uncle that will shoot through a tank. So I, I, I felt pretty good after that. Um, yeah, so my, my wife, there's like guns all over the place in our house. Um, they're, they're all secure. I don't like leave a loaded gun underneath my kid's crib. Uh, not, not like that. You know, we have guns around the place and you know, my wife can shoot, some, shoot a, uh, do a headshot from 50 yards uh, with my AR. I was like, I felt pretty good. You know, I, was, I was feeling great. I was like, man, somebody comes into my house when I'm not there, they're in trouble. You know? I was like, just call me when call me when you want me to clean up, baby. I'll be there, and we'll make it happen. And, and you, you you hear me say it, and you go, man, that's kind of kind of intense. You know, that's that's a little extreme. <laughs> Do you really need something that'll shoot through a tank? I was like, well, listen, you know, if somebody rolls up in my house with a tank, I got something to take care of business. <laughs> you know? like, it might happen. It ha happened in Hollywood. Dude stole the tank and went went down the road with it. See, if that guy. If those people were prepared, they could have stopped it. Um, and you look at that, and you go, man, that's kind of extreme. And hear, hear me when I say this. There's nothing I won't do to keep my family safe. There, there's no amount of money I wouldn't spend to keep them safe. Uh, it, if it required me buying a brand new house up on the hilltop, surrounded by a 500 foot fence with armed guards all over the place and landmines up the hill, um, if that's what it required for me to keep my family safe, I would do it. So I ask you this, what would you do to keep your family safe? Uh, a lot of times when, when, I, when I have to just have this discussion with some people, they go, what can I do to keep my family safe or keep my house secure? It's normally after their house has been broken into. And they go, now we, really, now we need to invest in, a, in an alarm system or you know, some guns or you know, whatever it is you think that will keep your, keep your house safe. It's usually after a burglary has already happened. You know, you know, they don't really think about it until after the house has been broken into. And so you know, we, kind of, we kind of talk about some of that stuff that you can do to keep your house secure. Um, and uh, you know, all, all the good things you can do to you know, you know, not telling the world where you are at certain times. Um, and, and I say that and I say, no matter how much you protect your family, no matter how much money you spend to keep them safe physically, it will mean absolutely nothing to you if you let the devil come into your house and soul nap your kids. What would you do to keep your child safe knowing that the devil is sitting at the door? I mean, he, he make no qualms about it. He will be more than happy to walk right through your front door and do everything he can to get you or your family to just tear apart so all of your souls can spend eternity with him. He makes no qualms about it. That is what he is out to do. So, so what can we do when it, when it relates to a cell phone? A couple things you can do. 
Now, these aren't like revolutionary ideas. I think like, man, he's such a genius. Uh, you've, you've probably heard all of these all, the whole time. You know, when, when you give um, a teenager or you know, some people decide you know, a nine-year-old needs to have a phone for some reason, uh, you know, we just kind of give them the phone and go, good luck. You know, you'll figure it out. You're, you're a smart kid. You know, I don't have a clue how to work it, but you, know, you, do, you do your best. You remember when, we, when um, in the good old days, when they would talk about having uh, computers, they'd always, you'd always hear the sermon about you know, keeping your computer safe. You know, where do you put your computer at? Well, you don't put it in your kid's room. You know, you'd always keep it in the living room or the dining room. It'd always be facing outward so everybody could see it. You know, so there wouldn't be, there was that deterrent you know, that was, was built in that you, know, you wouldn't go look at something you know, and mom, mom could literally turn around and see what you were looking at. And there was always that built-in deterrent. And then here come cell phones, which are just little computers, and we kind of hand it to them and just trust that they'll do the right thing. And, and I think the devil kind of waits on us to let our guard drop. Wait till we're not at home, or wait till we're not watching our home for him to just pounce right in. That's what he's waiting on. So I always tell parents, first off, if you're going to give someone a cell phone, if you're going to give one of your teenagers a cell phone, and hear me, I'm not anti-cell phones. Uh, I'm not anti-giving your kid a cell phone. Uh, I'm not for giving your kid a cell phone. I don't really have an opinion. It's kind of on you. If, you. if you think your kid is responsible enough, you know him better than I do. I just want to give you some cautions. If there is a passcode on it, you better know it. There is nothing worse than um, you, know, you, having a, you give them a phone and you say, well, unlock your phone. And they go, no. I told you, the NSA, if it's a, if it's a pretty advanced phone, the NSA can't unlock it. So if you don't know the code, you're kind of playing with fire. So know the code on it. You know how it works. That does take a little bit of education. You don't have to know everything about the phone. Um, but turning a blind eye to it is probably a little bit worse than just not knowing it or not trying to learn. At least you know a little bit about how it works. Um, be aware that there are some apps that will help you hide other apps. Um, uh, we were touching on that out in the, uh, out in the foyer. You, know, you can take an app, and you may not want your parents to know that you have it. And so they can download another app that will hide the other app inside of it. That's a little, that can get pretty webby really quick, huh? Um, there's an there's a app out there that can hide some of your pictures. You might take some uh, explicit pictures that you don't want anybody else seeing. You can hide them in there, and then there's a passcode on that app that you have to access. So you, you should probably be, just start snooping. Um, I know that sounds really bad from, for the teenager. I'm sorry. Um, but when it snoop, parents get, y'all are snoopers. You know, you know, I'll tell, most of the parents will tell me I am better than the FBI. You are. You, 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 know your, you know your kids. You know where they'll probably hide stuff. Just start snooping. You know, hey, what is this? What's that at? Let's play with that. See what that does. Oh. How's that on your phone? Uninstall. You know? Yeah. Just, but I mean, you don't have to do it in like a in a negative light, I guess you'd say. You know, just be like, hey, I want you to teach me how to use your phone. You want to make a good YouTube video? That's it right there. Teaching your parents how to use a phone. You're welcome. <laughs> Kidding. Um, do, are you going to allow social media? Uh, I have so I have so many parents come up to me and go, man, I didn't even know my kid was on social media. Uh, or this, my kid had like 500 profiles, uh, or, or what have you. Are you going to allow it? You know, are, are you going to put a limits on the cell phone? You, know, you can get on your Wi-Fi and turn your Wi-Fi off. So great one uh, that somebody said. You know, here's your list of things to do, um, and doing all three of these will unlock the daily password for the Wi-Fi. But you have to send me a picture that you have done all of them with today's date on a handwritten note. Oh, that's genius. You know, putting a different password on the Wi-Fi every day. That can probably, you can probably forget it once or twice. Uh, so uh, be careful doing that. You better write that down. Um, some people ask me, what, what is a good app to, like a parent parental monitoring app? I always say use caution with these. Um, here, here's why. If you go from no control uh, over the phone and you decide tomorrow morning you're going to download this app and you're going to put it on your child's phone and you're going to have 100% control, uh, overnight, I promise you, some of these guys over here might have, you might have a little issue, um, relationship-wise, not so much control-wise. I mean, how many of y'all would be like kosher if like mom and dad took over the phone like 100% and they knew everything you did tomorrow? Yeah, not a one of them. 
No, um, I always say use caution with that. You know, that might be the step you need to take. Um, but that could, you might win the battle, lose the war, relation, relationship uh, speaking. But if you want to know some of them, MM Guardian is a very good one. Uh, that one, the, what you do on that one, is you take a, the parental app goes on your phone, the child app goes on their phone. If you look on the, on the, um, on the reviews of it, the parental app has amazing reviews. The child one has horrible reviews. Because <laughs> the, uh, normally it's the teenager that goes on to the review and goes, this is horrible, it ruined my life. Um, so you, you kind of have to take that with uh, what you can do. So just a, a couple ideas of what, what can we as Christians do um, to fix this idea about where our kids get their value from. Because I mean, that's the root of the problem here. The cell phone's just kind of a, a symptom of the real problem, right? Um, there, there's, there's a loss of value. They, they're struggling to find out where this value is, and the cell phone really, really wants to show them where it is. But the cell phone's not going to do it. What, what can we do? What can we do to protect our homes? First thing I always tell people for, uh, in Christian homes, if you're only spending uh, two to three hours a week with Scripture, with your family, you know, coming to services Sunday and when Sunday, Sunday night and Wednesday, you know, you're checking your tab and you go, man, that, whew, we did great. You know, we went to all three services this week, high five. We are holy. We are righteous. Man, we are good Christians. Uh, and, that, and that's all the time you do. That's a lot of time for the devil to get in there. Um, so what, what do you do? Um, like we kind of said earlier, if you if when you come to services, leave your phone in the car. It's such a temptation. You get, bring, bring you a good old fashioned Bible. Um, like I said, because you're not going to get Facebook notifications through your Bible. Not yet, anyway. I'm sure that Bible's coming. But uh, you know, this this way, you're you're 100 percent concentrated on whatever the preacher's saying, whatever your elders are saying. You don't have to worry about you know the newest social tweet that has come out or you know, whatever your celebrity that you may follow is uh, talking about now. That can wait. You know, just leave the distractions outside the door. You know, the, the idea that you can only spend two or three hours a day and you think yeah, that's going to be a good groundwork for you, or two or three hours a, a week, and that's going to be great groundwork for uh, a good Christian to, to come up in is um, loony. Uh, and I don't mean to like step on anybody's toes when I say that, and I'm not saying you're a horrible person if that's all you do, um, but I'm telling you, you need to spend more time in that. Uh, how many hours a day does your teenager spend on a cell phone? A lot. How many times do you spend? How many times do you spend like getting outside influences that come in? A lot. And there's so much of it. You got to hit this up daily. Um, and I'm not talking just like maybe. It, it doesn't have to be like anything super, super like complex. You know, I don't. I'm not saying you need to have in-depth Bible studies about. Well, did Jephthah really sacrifice his daughter? I mean, you don't have to go like super deep. I mean, I encourage you, you know, go deep if you can. I mean, you don't have to start out that way. A lot of us are kind of intimidated about doing Bible studies with our families, right? And I think, yeah, I'm not a theologian. Like, I don't know the super ins and outs of all the scripture. I got a basic understanding of it. Dude, start there. It's basic. Your whole family probably has a basic understanding of how scripture works. You got to get intense about your scripture, uh, about your scripture, about your uh, Christianity. You know, uh, if you look over at Proverbs 6 and 5, it says, deliver yourself like a gazelle out of the hand of the hunter. You have to run. If you have ever seen a gazelle try to run from a lion on Discovery Channel, he is running like his life depends on it. And it does. That's what you're going to tell me. You've got to run. You've got to get intense about this Christianity stuff. This isn't something you can only do two days a week and be like, man, I am pleasing God this week. I went to all three services. I know he's proud of me right now. Man, he's probably... If this was a Facebook post, he would like it. You know, you know, think of First Peter 5 eight. It's, it's a warning over and over and over again. The devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that is not just uh, us older people. He wants your kids. He wants your family. He wants everything about you. He is coming to eat you. you got to get intense about this stuff. You can't like wait until your kid's like half devoured and go, all right, now I'm going to go save my kid. Usually it's a little bit too late from there. Here's what, here's what I want to do. As a family, I want to have daily, daily time where the entire family, we all put our cell phones in a box, um, and what we're going to do is we're all going to sit at the table together, and we're going to have just a little bit of family Bible time. I said, it doesn't have to be, you know, maybe like 15 minutes we're going to spend in God's Word. 
Here, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to um, go through, we're going to read Matthew 1 together. That's where we're going to start. Matthew 1, maybe Genesis 1. You know, we're, we're going to read through that chapter. And what, what does that mean to you and me? You know, what, what does Matthew 1 mean to you and me right now? You know, when we start reading, we go, oh man, look at all these, uh, look at this long lineage of names that I cannot pronounce. What, what does that mean to me? And it means, you know, you, you look at that and go, what, what's your opinion? Why, why do you think a genealogy would be really, really important in Matthew? You know, you know just, get, just get some uh, feedback. You know, what, do you think, what are you thinking about that? Why would Matthew think so many thousands of years ago that that was really, really important for you and me to know? I mean, it's, it's not like a super complex answer. It traces the lineage of Christ. You know, it shows, it shows where Jesus came from. There was a lineage Christ had to follow. Right? So that shows that Christ came through that lineage just like it was prophesied. It means that Christ is who he really says he is. And that was really important to who Matthew was writing to. So he was writing to a more Jewish audience. So there's some, while, while you and I might just go kind of skim over all that, then you kind of look at it and you go, man, Matthew chapter 1, let's, let's look at some of the people that he, that he had in here. And, you know, um, you, you start scrolling down through it and you're like, man, I cannot pronounce any of these names. And you go, oh, look here, um, Josiah, the father of Jeconiah. And you go, man, who is that? And some of you kind of go, I have no idea who that guy is. All of them are found in the Old Testament. And you kind of go, man, look at, look at this guy. Um, you know, let me tell you about Judah. I know where Judah came from because his cop from Savannah came and told us. Um, Judah was the son of Leah. And let me tell you about Leah. I don't have to tell you that again because you already heard it. Um, man, you know, she was in a tough spot. You know how valuable you are? Let me tell you how valuable you are. Not just to, not just to God. Um, I want to tell you how valuable you are to me. You see, God entrusted you to me. And I, you are mine until um, you turn 18 legally, but you'll always be mine, right parents? You're always mine. Um, until, uh, you know, I, you are entrusted with somebody else who is going to be entrusted with you until he gives your hand back to God. That's how valuable you are to me. I would do anything in this world to keep you safe. I will protect you from anybody including yourself. That's my responsibility as a parent. I want you to know that. And I'm going to tell you that every single day. That's going to get really, really redundant. But, uh, but I promise you, I, I will never get tired of telling my kids I love them. They might get tired of, me, of hearing it. But I, I don't care. You can sit down and listen. Because you're not going to go outside my doors not knowing that daddy didn't love you. Right? You're not going to go out there not knowing that mama didn't love you. And that mama will, you know, Tear somebody apart to save you. Because mama's a hillbilly. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, I, w- I want to I wanna talk to you about some of, some of the suffering that Paul went through. So when you're in school today and you're realizing that you know, all these people are making fun of you, they want to run you out of the school, that Paul was in a very similar predicament. You know, he was getting ran out of city after city after city. And he always remained faithful. I want you to use that today when you're in high school. You know, and, and it may not even have to be something super Bible related. You know, it has a Bible tone to it. Oh, oh look, I read in the paper today that there was a, uh, a wreck on, you know, on 575 or 575, you know, uh, they think alcohol was involved. Hmm. And you brought, and all your friends are talking about getting drunk at high school. Think how dangerous that can be. All right, Daddy loves you. Yeah, well, we're gonna spend, we're gonna spend some, we're gonna spend some serious time Diving into, um, diving into God's word. If you look over at Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 25, the writer there gives an admonition to the people. He's like, listen, I want you talking about the word. When you, when, you're, when you go to lay down in bed, I want you talking about it. When you get up, I want you talking about it. When you're sitting at the table, I want you talking about it. When you're walking in the way, I want you talking about it. You've got to ingrain their stuff. Teens are hard-headed. No offense. Sometimes... Um, you really got to drill this stuff into them. Y'all know you're hard-headed. Don't even knock on crazy. Yeah, you got you got to pound it into them. You know, th- this isn't uh, something you can kind of learn through osmosis. You can't stick the Bible underneath your pillow and hope that they're going to know it in the morning. You know, it doesn't work that way. You got to always be talking about this stuff. You got to get intense about it. And it's not something that has to be like super, super boring. You know, people think, oh, why are we studying numbers? Ugh, what is numbers even all about? I hate numbers. Yeah. And it's, it's really not a complicated book. Some really, really cool stories come out of numbers. 
You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be boring. No, I would venture to uh, make a very strong argument. Nothing in scripture is boring. You can make an application for almost anything in scripture towards you in, in your daily Bible studies that you're doing with your family. <coughs> Look over at Acts 17, verse 11. It said, these were no, more noble than those that were in Thessalonica, and that they examined the scriptures and daily to see what those things were so. Who were they receiving that word from? When they, were, when they were getting all of them, they were examining the scriptures, who did they get the original word from? It was the apostles. And yet those guys were still checking up on them to make sure that everything that they were saying was kosher with what the scripture was saying. You know, 2 Timothy uh, 2.15, of study to show yourself approved unto God. He's dr- drilling this into us so we can drill it into our families. We have to get intentional about our Bible study. And it's not just studying what, what the scriptures are saying. It's what does that mean to you and me? You know, how can we how can we apply this to everybody? Take take advantage of all these teach of all the teachable moments that you have in the throughout the day. And down where I live, it storms like every single day. So it'll be really, really hot in the morning, it'll storm at lunchtime, and it'll be really, really, really hot throughout the rest of the afternoon. You know what comes out right after a storm? A rainbow. I've got some crazy photos. You can see where I'm at, the rainbow goes from one side, and you can see a complete arch to the other side. Uh, so, so my six-year-old son, I said, man, isn't that cool? Man, you know who put that there? And he of course, that God did. I said, why, why, would he put, why would he put a rainbow like that? What was his original point for putting a rainbow up there? It was a promise. He's never going to flood the world again. I think that's so cool that it always comes after a storm. You know? Uh, it's, like, it's like reassuring that promise that God's not going to flood the earth again. You know? We're, we're going through the, uh, we're, going, we're driving through a storm. And my son always tell me, hit the swishers. Those are the wipers. He calls them swishers. Because uh, every, time, every time we turn them on, they go, I go, swish, swish, swish. So I'll make the noise. He makes the noise. Drives mama crazy. So I'm like, you know, um, now let, me, let me tell you about these wipers. You know, just like, just like the water, um, the, the, the wipers just wash the water away. And that's how God is for a Christian who's walking in the light. If you're doing what God says, he's continually cleansing you. Just wiping it away. That's what, God, that's what God does for you and me. That's his promise for you and me. You and I walk in the light, continual cleansing, just like a wiper. That way we can see. So, uh, you know, the little things. You, know, you, go, you walk by, you know, you see a beer can on the ground. You know, hey, we, we should probably stay away from alcohol. You know, God is over and over again in Scripture. He t- wants you don't even look at it. And you know, doesn't want you looking at it. Nothing that has to be super, you know, theological explosion in their heads. You know, something they never thought of. But you're always taking a, um, you're taking a serious stand for your Bible study. And part of that is, in, in doing that, you're kind of reaffirming that how valuable they really are to God. How valuable they are to you. You know, so they don't walk out of here and go, man, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, uh, you know, do, do mom and dad love me? What, am I valuable? I, I don't get it. You know, you know am I? A question that, that, that shouldn't even be a doubt in their mind. Be careful what we allow to come into our homes. What, what kind of movies are we watching? You know, we, we, want, we, want, we don't want to have a stockpile of movies that counter, counterdict everything that we are trying to teach our kids. And I used to have a stockpile of movies. That was my thing when uh, I was probably in my early 20s. Is I, would, I would collect movies. You know, we always have all the, all the movies and stuff all over the walls. I, I think I had about 500. Um, and one day it came up, uh, I was listening to my, my friend Brad Harib, and he said, you know what sickens me? When I walk into a house and it says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, beautiful plaque up on the wall, and then right underneath it, you have like the most immoral movies in the world. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I go home and I've got one of those up there and like right underneath it is literally my, my stash of DVDs. And I was like, that man's been in my house. <laughs> so uh, we went in there, three trash bags, industrial trash bags full of DVDs, went right in the garbage. That, that very night, I was like, man, uh, no, we, we were done watching that. We're going we're gonna to stop watching all these TV shows uh, that promote, you know, being drunk and having, having uh, wild parties, and they're all about, you know, sowing your wild oats and all that other craziness, you know. Uh, staying with uh, Jeremy last night, he said, my family doesn't have cable. And I love that. Uh, we, I don't think, uh, we, had, we hadn't had cable for like six years. And, you know, friends, friends come over, like, hey, let's go watch the football game. Uh, sorry, I don't have cable. What do you mean you don't have cable? I was like, you don't have cable. 
And I said, what do you do? I'm like, have family time. <laughs> we talk. <laughs> so they would, um, they, that was just like completely mind-boggling. You know, um, you know, maybe, maybe you have cable, and I'm not dogging you if you have cable. No, no, don't get me wrong. But make sure you're taking time to turn off the television. You know how you spell love to your kids? T-I-M-E. You, 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 can't, you can't show a kid love by being constantly in front of a screen and ignoring them. On the flip side of that, you can't show love to your parents by being in front of your screen and uh, the exact same thing. So he, here's what I want to challenge you to do. If you have cable, I dare you to turn it off for a year. Call, the, call Comcast, call whoever you got. Say, listen, we're killing the cable for a year. You can call, you can call me and annoy me in a year, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. See if you, I, I promise you your family life will improve. It's almost, you know, it's like, what, what, what do we do now? It's almost shocking. You know, cause I, you know when, we, when we killed our cable, we're like, man, man, now what do we do? I guess we can talk again. You know, I mean, we did get married. You know, so so we, started, we started talking, and now, now our kids aren't, like, being glued in front of the TV. So now I can talk to them and find out what's going on in his day. You know, you know Brandon, what was great about your day? Oh, you know, we played outside. I made new friends, you know, whatever. I ate a bunch of sugar balls at school. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, if you're watching something that is causing your Christianity to stumble, Matthew 5, 29 and 30 says, if, you're right, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. It's better for you to lose an eye than to lose your soul. You're not literally saying pluck out your eye. But, you know, you're saying if you've got something that is holding you back, it's better for you to cut it off and throw it away. What do we, what do we listen to on the radio? Mm, that's a touchy one. I don't know that there's a godly station you can listen to, uh, musically speaking. You know, if you, uh, you you look at some of the the country music that's out there today, one of the most popular songs now is "I Don't Have a Drinking Problem" because I don't have a problem with drinking. And then I was like, wow. You know, a couple years ago, um, a song called "Dirt Road Anthem." You listen to the lyrics of that song. He said, I'm um, Going down, going down the dirt road with a nice cold beer in the center console. He literally promotes drunk driving. And they called him on it. And I said, are you promoting drunk driving? He said, no, I'm just singing about what we do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> kind of promoting it there. Um, you, you listen to some of the, um, some other music where they're, where they're promoting, you know, violence or, you know, doing this to women, dr drinking alcohol or, you know, um, yeah. It ranges from every type of music you have, and it's not it's not local to one. You know, what what if we go down? What if we get into our van or our cars today, and we just decide to go turn off? And you, and you get that question again. Now what do we do? Man, you get to talk to your family. You know, find out what's going on in the world. What 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 are your kids struggling with? You know, what how, how's their day been? What 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 are there some troubles that they're going through? Or maybe, you know, you, you get, a, get an iPod. Get your little iPod and fill it up with some uh, a cappella music, some worship songs. Maybe some sermons from your, from your favorite cop who came from Savannah. Kidding. You don't have to put me on there. But I, I used to have my, my iPod that I had. If I pressed play on it and let it go, it would not stop. Of course, if I gave it power, it would not stop for three months. That's how many, how many lessons or songs or something that I had on. I could just plug into my radio and just let it play. So when, when my kids would be in the car, you know, they could listen to you. They could sing some worship songs, try to learn them. So when they come here, they can sing along with us instead of not knowing what's going on. You know, just little stuff. Your friends might get in the car. Like, what are you listening to? Now let me tell you about, the, let me tell you about this sermon that we're, you're about to listen to. Mm-hmm. Sowing some seeds. They go, I don't want to listen to that. Okay. <laughs> Go get in your car. <laughs> you know, um, so, you know, just, just little stuff that you can do like that. Because here's the problem that we're finding with a lot of families. You know, when, you, when you're stuck in front of these phones or in front of these screens, like I said, studies are showing you forget how to communicate. And that's the problem with a lot of our families. The reason I go to so many domestic violence disputes is because there's a breakdown of communication. And generally, here's how it goes. Mom or dad say this. Teenager says this, but while one of them is talking, the other one is already thinking about the response, right? Yeah, 
I'm, I'm dad and I'm telling little Timmy about how it's going to be, but little Timmy has a little response that he's already thinking, so he's not really listening to the logic that is coming out of my mouth or vice versa. And so you're not, neither one of you are listening to each other when both of you uh, could really have a sim very simple explanation for what is happening. Uh, or very, very simple, uh, you could meet in the middle. But usually we don't listen. We're always thinking of that comeback that we have because we always want to get the, the last word in, right? So there's, there's a breakdown of the communication. If, you, if you're taking away all these distractions, you and your family can communicate again. And all these things are getting in the way of you communicating. All right, here's another touchy one. We're going to monitor how we dress. Oh, he's hitting the modesty thing. Yeah. Um, I, I, have a, I have a struggle when uh, I, I go by and I, I see guys with their pants halfway around their ankles or not wearing a lot of clothes. Uh, and it, it, I've, 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 talked to, I've talked to the modesty speech a million times. This, it isn't one side or the other, um, you know. I, I could harp on, you know, ladies wearing clothes that are too short or too tight. I could say the exact same thing for guys who wear uh, clothes that are too tight or too short or what have you. Um, I'll leave you with that. Monitor how you dress. Uh, if I remember in Genesis 38, a lady named Tamar <coughs> says she put on the clothes of a harlot. Now, I know that's kind of one-sided, you know, but there were apparently clothes at that time that you could wear that when somebody looked at you, they assumed that you were a prostitute. Remember, remember when, when you become a Christian, you're, not, you're supposed to be in the world, but you're not of it. We're supposed to be completely different from how the world is. So be very, very careful about how you dress. Now, because both guys and girls, I'm not, I'm not like beating the ladies down, I'm not beating the guys down. Both need to monitor how we dress. Remember parents, you are in charge of your parents. Uh, I, I have, uh, I always ask some of the, um, those the highest ones, how did you make it out of your house? And they go, my parents love the way I dress. So your parents are crazy. I call their parents and tell them they're crazy. And, uh, um, but my, seriously, I'm, there's a reason God did not give me a daughter. I have three boys, I would probably lose my marbles. Uh, so if you have a daughter, God bless you. Okay, kidding, I'm kidding. Um, All right, switching gears. We're going to, as a family, here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend some time in prayer together. Have you taught your kids how to pray? Your kids know how? That's probably one of the most re re rewarding experiences of being a dad is teaching my kids how to pray. Man, it's so cool. There's, there's nothing better than watching a six-year-old, you know, make up his prayer to God, you know. Yeah, I was a, Jeremy's house and, and, and his son blessed the food and I was like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm like, this is awesome. You know, you're spending time in prayer. What, what can you pray for for your kids? You ever asked them that? How, how can I pray for you? We always feel a little funny about that, don't we? I and mean, we believe in the power of prayer. It's just hard for us to go, how can I pray for you? We feel a little funny about it, don't we? We really should. You know, you know, what, prayer, you know what prayer says when, when you ask somebody, hey, what can I pray about for you? Because I love you. And right now, the only thing I want to do is I want to go before God on your behalf. I want to take your concerns, whatever you got. You know, this isn't, you know, mom and son or, you know, dad and daughter time. You know, this is, this is just you and me. You know, we're, you tell me what your issues are. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you about them. And, we're, you know, if it's something we can work out together, that's what we're going to try to do. But right now, we're going to pray together. I'm going to teach you why we pray. Do you know why we pray? They say, well, it's to tell God our problems. Well, okay. You know, it's not like God doesn't already know them. He's all-knowing, right? It's more of an acknowledgement that we know them. You're also asking God for help. Maybe you're asking God for help on somebody else's behalf. You literally get to go before the throne room of God and talk to him. That is wild. You know? When was the last time you sat down with somebody uh, at church and said, you know, Hey, hey um, you know, I want to go to the elders, I want to go to our minister, I want to go to our deacons, I want to go to you know, whoever teaches my cl our class in the morning, you know, whoever is in charge of the nursery, you know, I want to go to them and say, listen, um, I was thinking about, you know, I never, never told you thank you, listen, can I pray with you? It just, you know, I, I want to thank God for you, because you are a huge help. Yeah? I'm telling you, prayer 
will rock somebody's world when you just go to them and say, listen, I want to pray with you. Teach your kids how to pray. Spend time in prayer with them. Let them know you are serious about some prayer life. It's not something you should be embarrassed about. You know, some people kind of get a little funny about praying in public with people. Um, you know, or, you know, they're over here praying with somebody and they feel a little funny because, you know, people are watching them uh, or, or what have you. You know, don't, don't worry about all that. You know, it's, about, it's about you and them. You, you and your kids or, you know, don't be scared to go ask your parents, you know, can we pray about something? That, that shouldn't be a fear that you have. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. God really wants you to have a strong prayer life. It's part of communicating with God. You know, I'm not talking about just praying before a meal or you know, right before you go to bed, have bedtime prayers. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what, some, something other than that. Like we want, we want to pray about how our day went. But then we're also going to kind of tell them about you know, being mindful why we pray. Here's what we don't pray for. You know, we're, we're not going to pray for a new cell phone. You know, we're not going to pray for uh, us to get a, a brand new car or us to have a lot of money, you know, stuff that we want. Some of you old people may remember this movie, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Yes, you, um, how many of y'all have seen that? Yeah, not a one of y'all. <laughs> I'm showing my age here. All right, so Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Essentially what it is, Indiana Jones is on the hunt for the, what they call um, the Cup of Christ. Um, so he's, he's out there looking for it. And uh, so they, there's a boat chase scene that goes on, some bad guys, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, Indiana Jones and this guy, uh, they're, they're wrestling on, on the dock. And he's like, you know, why, you know, you're trying to find you know, the cup of Christ. And they're like, no, I'm just trying to find my dad, blah, blah, blah. So the guy ends up asking Indiana Jones a question. He said, why do you seek the cup of Christ? Is it for your glory or for his? I said, man, you can apply that to your prayer life, can't you? Why are you praying? Is it for your glory? Is it for his? Are you P-R-A-Y or are you P-R-E-Y? You know, I can take some serious soul searching. You know, am I asking this because I want God to be glorified or because I want to be glorified? You get to teach your kids that. You know, you know they might, my, my kids, uh, every, t- every night, here's what we do at my house. My kids have to pick out five people for them to pray for. And they got to pray for him every single night. And this isn't me going, look how awesome I am as a dad. Uh, just, just an idea. Some, some people say, you know, how do I get started in this? You know, every day they got to pray for five people. And usually, without fail, uh, they, my oldest one, he picks the same five. And then my three-year-old copies him. I'm good with it. <laughs> you know, uh, three-year-old probably doesn't know that many people to pray for. But he, he copies him. And so what, when Brandon is praying, you know who's listening? The little brother. The little brother almost mimics the exact same thing that his older brother's doing. I haven't taught Caleb how to pray yet, but he's learning based off of what we have taught Brandon. He's just hopping from one to the other. Do you want to spend some serious time in prayer? You know, learning how to pray, learn how to pray with your family. Don't feel funny about it. You know, you know, Jesus was there in the garden. He said, I'm going to go pray. Yeah, y'all wait here. He goes and prays for an hour, comes back, and everybody's sleeping. You know, how cool would that have been to, to be there beside Jesus while he's praying? You know, like, man, that's, that's some serious stuff right there. How cool would that be? You kind of get to do that, though. You get to pray. You literally stand before God, and you're, you're pouring your heart out to him, letting him know what's up. <laughs> he, might, he might listen to all this, and you go, man, that's a bit extreme. That's a little crazy. You talking about daily Bible studies? Never got time for that. You want to start, you want to actually you know, like come together as a family and have like a dinner time and prayer time and no cell phones? It's a big stream. That is a whew, you're asking a lot. I know. The reason why the reason why I would I would suggest all of those is because at the end of the day, should something happen to your family, here's the position you don't want to be in. You don't want to be in that position where you're looking back at how you have led your family or how you have acted with your parents or how you have raised your teenagers and wonder, was there something else I could have done? What else could I have done that would have changed this? You do not want to be in a position where you were second-guessing yourself of how you've lived your life. I promise you that will eat you alive.
I've, I've given too many death notifications to parents. And they go, man, what else could I have done? All you can do is all you can do. So I, I hope that's kind of helped you, give, gives you an idea of what we can do to kind of root this problem of where our kids find their value. Psalm 127 says, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build. If God is not the foundation upon which you are building your house, your house is going to fall. I want to I end with giving you um, one last story, and then I'll give you the invitation. I was driving, uh, I was working last spring break, and I was, I had just begun an assignment by a sergeant. She said, hey, I need you to take these papers to the Kroger. It was for uh, an event that we were doing. We, went, we need Kroger to sponsor us. So we, she hands me these papers. She says, will you go drop these off at Kroger? I said, absolutely. So I'm heading down Kroger. And I'm going, I pull up to one of our major intersections in our city, and there are two left turn lanes that I can get into. I'm a creature of habit, so I always get into the, le- I always get into the left one. But part of me was thinking, well, I've got to make a right turn soon, so I will get into the right turn lane. I had literally pulled up to the right turn lane um, and stopped. I'm sitting there, doo, 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 waiting on the red light, and something catches my eye out of my rearview mirror. And I look up, and it is a full-size Ford Explorer. Uh, that was red, and it was bearing down on me. I can, I've, I've done uh, speed uh, traffic enforcement with uh, speeding enforcement and stuff like that, so I can visually tell how fast he's going and be within three. I can look and I can tell he's doing 45 and he's not stopping. He's not slowing down at all. And he's coming up in the right-hand turn lane. And I can't go anywhere. There's a car in front of me, the car's on the side of me, we're all at a red light. And I'm thinking, this is, <laughs> this is gonna hurt. Uh, so I'm just kind of bracing for the impact and right before he hits me, snatches hard right or snatches hard left, and crushes the car sitting right beside me. It had a 92-year-old uh, man was driving it. His wife was in the passenger seat. Uh, he would kill the driver, the the older man. He would hit that car so hard it pushed him into a SUV that was in front of him, pushed him into a car that was in front of him, and pushed him into a car that was in front of her, or in front of him. Yeah. So four cars involved total, and the driver of the car that he hit died. Uh, when I got out to him, you know what he was holding? Holding his cell phone. You know what he was doing? Playing on it while he was driving. Now, it, if I want to be honest with you, there, there was quite a while that I really, really did not like myself. So I always thought, you know, uh, I always get in the left turn lane. And for some reason that day, I got an assignment that put me in the right turn lane. And I was like, wow. It was like, that should have been me that got hit. I should have taken a hit. You know, it, I should have had the, uh, I should have had it where, you know, I should have just gotten in that left turn lane and that way he would have hit me and then the uh, gentleman who was driving would have survived. But I didn't, I got in the right. And I'll tell you, you want know, to talk about some struggles. I had, I mean, you were talking, it was, it was not pretty. There were, there were times you, you really, really just do not like yourself. I was like, man, why didn't I get in the left turn? Because it should have been me. I was like, man, it, it should have been me. You want to talk about asking God some questions? I felt like Joe for a minute. You know? Yeah, Joe was kind of asking, you know, why? You know, and I was, I was asking the same question. Should have been me. I'm like, God, should have been me. You know it should have been me. I knew it should have been me. And... You know, I'm struggling with this. I, was, I just kept asking myself that qu- same question, or telling myself that same thing. Should have been me. Should have been me. And I'll tell you, it should have been me. Should have been me. It should have been you. But for some reason, God God sees so much value in you and me that it wasn't you or me. It was His son. It was His son that went to the cross instead of you and me. Should have been you. Should have been me hanging on that cross because of how messed up we are. But it wasn't. And there's a reason why it wasn't you and me. Because you and me are so valuable in the eyes of God. I still have trouble, trouble trying to comprehend that. That an infinite God loves a finite creature like me. So much so that he would be willing to send his son out of paradise and to suffer a lonely, agonizing death just so you and I could be right back there with him. Should have been me. Should have been you. The question is, what do you do with the opportunity now that you have it? 
You know, what are you going to do with your life? Are you going to spend it sitting in front of a cell phone? Or are you going to spend it working, working as hard as you can to get as many people to realize how valuable they really are? That's kind of the whole sum up of the gospel. Why, why did my Savior come to, come to this earth? Because he loved me so. How could you love someone like me? Because you and I are so valuable. I can say that over and over and over again. And I, I don't know that it will ever truly sink into my, my little brain of how valuable I really am. I hope it sinks into yours just enough to where you realize that whatever state you are living in, if you know that it is not in a manner that is pleasing to God, you need to make it right. Do not walk out those doors knowing that your life is wrong with God, that you haven't been doing all you can as a, as a, as a, as a child, as a parent, if whatever. If you walk out those doors not taking the opportunity that God had or that God offers you, you have no idea what red light you might be sitting at when somebody smacks you and sends you into eternity. I've had so many close calls with death. Me and him are almost on a first name basis. Uh, I was driving on the way up here, car right in front of me spun out, went down into the ditch. And I was like, it, it could have happened to him right there. That could have been it for him. Of course, I could have been the car in front of him. It could have been me that went down into the ditch. You just don't know when, when, life's gonna, when your life's going to run out. If, if we can help you in any, way, in any way, shape, or form today, why not take the opportunity to have one of the elders here pray for you? Maybe, maybe you need a little bit more Bible study. You've, you've heard about this guy, Jesus, and you're, you're kind of like, okay, I want to look into this. I want to know what Scripture really says. You know, I want to I know, uh, know more about the salvation business. I'm interested. Let, let somebody here, let one of the elders, one of the deacons here pray for you and maybe do a Bible study with you so you can get right with God. If we can help you in any way, shape, or form, why don't you come forward as we stand, the, uh, stand and sing the invitation song?